Well, it's 20 years since the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, sent shockwaves of grief literally around the world. And thousands upon thousands of, of people line the streets of London on the day of Princess Diana's funeral. There was this remarkable phenomenon of folk grieving for this very well-known public figure. And many of those who grieved and mourned actually hardly knew her at all. And now, even 20 years on, it can't have escaped your notice to have seen in the newspaper and on various forms of of media um, articles that have been run about Princess Diana reflecting on her sometimes troubled life, but also on the legacy that she has left. Perhaps by comparison this morning, reading as Jeff has just done from the Old Testament uh, passage in, in Genesis um, about the death of a man called Jacob and the funeral which ensued might seem at first glance not to be one that would catch the headlines of the day if there were such things as headlines of the day in Jacob's day several thousand years ago. And yet there was a royal element in it, you see, because Jacob's one of Jacob's younger sons, Joseph, was like the president, really, of, of Egypt and had status and dignity such that the ruler of Egypt, Pharaoh, ensured that the funeral was one to be remembered. And he sent with this great cortege from the land of Egypt into the land of Canaan where Jacob had instructed he should be buried. He sent chariots with the charioteers. So these were the, the limousines and the stretch limos of the day to make that journey from Egypt into Canaan. It would be a cortege that would certainly be noticed to bury this old man Jacob, who was actually 147 when he died, and to bury him in the country from which he came, the land of Canaan. And the locals in Canaan, when they saw this great cortege approaching, and they heard and saw for themselves a tremendous scene of mourning. Um, the writer records for us there um, in, in, in Genesis that they mourned there with a great and very solemn lamentation. It kind of stood out, this, this event. And uh, so much so that the local yokels they changed the name of the place where this funeral cortege had arrived at at that stage. And they called it Abel Misraim, which means mourning of Egypt. Because it stood out in, the, in, in, in their minds. You might have thought this morning, coming to Ridgeway Community Church, um, or maybe you might have seen on the, on the website that we advertised our, our message this morning is under the heading dealing with death. And you might have thought, well... Bill, couldn't you have chosen a different passage than than a funeral and the death of an old man to to preach from? Well, yes, I could have done, but I decided not to, because this Bible that we have is is a remarkable book, and everything that's in it has something to say to to you and to I in this 21st century in which we live, every part of it. And the Bible doesn't avoid the issue of death. Now, of course, it's a sensitive matter. I'm aware of that, because death is something that has affected all of us. Probably without exception, we all know what it feels like to lose a loved one. Or perhaps we have been touched or affected in some way by the death of someone or another, whether that was Princess Diana or somebody that might have just been known to us, as well as those that were so close to us. And we know, of course, that one day, you and I will surely die. It's a sensitive matter, isn't it? But it's an important one. I'm not a reader of Shakespeare, but 
Shakespeare's last play that he wrote, The Tempest, in the final scene of his final play, Prospero, one of the, the, the characters, and please don't ask me any information about Shakespeare afterwards, um, but Prospero said, every third thought is of my grave. You see, because he was approaching his final time on earth. And that might seem to be a very sort of morbid philosophical statement. But you see, when we come to the Bible and we think of this dealing with death and we look at the funeral and death of this man Jacob, we find therein a hope of which Jacob himself spoke before he died. A hope indeed that can be your hope and mine through Jesus Christ. I'm sure you're aware that in the times in which we live in the 21st century, that people's response to the issue of death kind of varies. And I said, it's always dangerous, isn't it, to generalise and put people into groups. But there are some trains of thought that we can see in our generation and we may be able to relate to those in some way this morning, as I mentioned them. There are those who still ignore the implications of it, of death. It's a t- taboo subject. You don't, you don't talk about it. Not so long ago, I was talking to someone who was really quite poorly, and as sensitively and as delicately as I felt I could in my pastoral role, I sought to just gently say to them, look, you, you've got to think about your situation. You know, this, is, this is important. But they found it difficult, maybe, maybe through fear. Of course, sometimes it's not fear that makes the taboo, it's a carelessness and... People are light and superficial and make light of it. But that's neither wise nor helpful. And then there are those, those who don't ignore it, but they think only of the manner of it. And you'll talk to them and they'll be almost wondering about, you know, well, will it be disease? Will it be accident? Will it be prolonged? Will it be sudden? Um, am I to be buried or am I to be created? And in the 18th and 19th centuries, that was a couple of hundred years back, there was something that um, the medical term is called taphophobia. And uh, that essentially is a term for the fear of being buried alive as a result of being wrongly pronounced dead. Of course, in those times, they didn't have the the medical expertise to, to determine so readily whether a person was simply in some kind of stupor in their collapse or whether they actually died. There was very this very real fear and some enterprising people developed safety coffins and uh, some, some developed a simple device so that there was like a, a, a line that was tied round the hand of the deceased person and ran up to the surface attached to a bell so that if they did become conscious they could pull the line and sort of ring the bell and other things were more complicated mechanical contraptions that could detect movement and then alert the cemetery attendant by lighting a candle or some other such thing or even open a periscope so the deceased person who was now alive could actually peer through the periscope I suppose the Egyptians they embalmed their dead very often certainly for the, the, the nobles and the wealthy people this, this lengthy process if, if you want to read about embalming it's quite interesting but I warn you it's quite gruesome in its, in its way so I'm not going to describe that to you but that, the process was very effective even though it's thousands of years ago, in preserving the features of the person who had died and and the shape, the bulk of, of, of the person. And it was done because the Egyptians, they didn't worship the, the Lord of the, of the Bible. They didn't worship him. They made their own gods. And they had a, a god called Osiris, and he was the god of the afterlife, of resurrection and stuff like that, that they would think about for the, for the afterlife. And so they were preserving the body for the afterlife, because they had this great emphasis on that, that physical body. And they, they would have little cartons and jars around with, with, with things 
in them and they would chant things and put amulets or charms in the body and even worse things were uh, were done with some of the, the, the pharaoh's attendants were, were almost entombed with the pharaoh so they could look after the pharaoh in the, in the afterlife. But there was no foundation to their, their belief. That was the way they were trying to, to deal with, with death. Some ignore it. Some just think about the manner of it. And, and the Egyptians created this whole plethora, these great many gods and things to try and lessen the impact of it somehow and preserve the body. But you see, the Bible tells us quite clearly that at death the body remains and the soul departs, that soul that is the real you. You can read in the New Testament the very words of Jesus. He made a distinct distinction between the body and the soul. You can read that in Matthew 10 verse 28. They're quite solemn words because he's actually saying, look, don't fear those who can harm the body, but fear those who can or fear God then, who has command of the soul and its destiny. And actually, the person who is a, is a Christian doesn't need to worry about embalming or preserving the body. Do you know, it will not matter one bit what happens to this body of mine, whether it's mangled in an accident or racked by disease, because the Bible has said that as a believer, one day I will have a brand new body. There will be this amazing resurrection, this great miracle at the end of time when my soul will rejoin the body that will then never decay or grow old. It's a sobering truth, isn't it? Death. I wonder how you think in, in your mind. If we're without hope, maybe sometimes there's a morbidity with it. You know, people talk about the grim reaper. But if men and women are careless and glib sometimes to them, it becomes an opportunity when someone dies for a celebration or a, or a party. And solemnity is just thrown aside. And we do see a little bit of a, a growing trend in our society whereby folks are almost felt out of it if they mourn and grieve and weep and cry and feel the pain. But sadly, when someone dies, often people seek solace and comfort in the wrong place and will go to spiritualist mediums, seances, thinking that they can contact their loved one. We understand the motivation in their vulnerability, but that's something the Bible warns against and forbids it will only create a delusion, an illusion about the matter of death. So what is it about the death of Jacob then? What is it in his words that, that tell us something about how, how death can be dealt with? The, to bring us to a different place, to have a different outlook, a different perspective. Because his words actually reveal a joyous hope. For he says, as he's about to breathe his last, he says, I am going to be gathered to my people. And the writer records at the end of chapter 49 as he breathed his last and he was gathered to his people. It's a, I don't, I don't understand the Hebrew language but much of the Old Testament was written originally in Hebrew. But those scholars who do say that this phrase, gather to my peoples, is very powerful in its suggestiveness that Jacob, though he was about to die, yet in some sense, though not in the body, he would most certainly be actually alive, but in a different way. Jesus himself, several thousand years later, he spoke of the life that is to come. And Jesus quotes from what God the Father had said to Moses years before. And he says that God, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of 
Jacob. Isaac was Jacob's father and Abraham was Jacob's grandfather. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And then Jesus comments on what God the Father had said to Moses all those years ago. In this words, he says, God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And he was answering people with that statement who denied that death was anything but it was just the end. That was it. You lived, you died and finished. There was nothing more. And Jesus was contradicting them and stating quite clearly, no it, no, it is not. Think about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. They're long dead, but God is the God of the living. Their life, you see, was not snuffed out. The idea of annihilation at death is completely false and completely contrary to what the Bible teaches. Even right here in the Old Testament, in the earliest of times, Jacob speaks of being gathered to his people in death. To put it in New Testament language, Jacob was going home, going home to heaven to be with the Lord in whom he trusted. His body would go to the ground, it would be buried in that tomb. And you see, Jacob's instructions to his son Joseph and thence to Pharaoh and the others tell us about his expectation, his, his view of what was about to happen. I'm going to be gathered to my peoples and, he said, you are to bury me in that cave that my grandfather bought from the Hittite. That's where I'm to be buried, in that cave, in the field, which is in the land of Canaan. I don't want to be buried in Egypt. That was where Jacob was, and he died in Egypt. I want to be buried in Canaan, because God had promised that land to be the dwelling place for his people in the future. And Jacob was saying, bury me there. Because even though we don't live there now, God's promise will come to pass, and my hope is in that. That's what Jacob's saying in the immediate context. But when we turn to the New Testament, we find that Jacob actually is described in Paul's letter to the Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, along with his ancestors, that these were a people for whom the dwelling in that promised land of Canaan was but mirroring a permanent dwelling place in heaven. So Jacob, in holding on to that promise, the very funeral instructions that he left, you are to take me on that journey, my body from Egypt to Canaan, because God has promised that land and more than that, He's promised heaven to those who trust in him for salvation through Jesus Christ. You see, dwelling in a promised land ran far deeper than the future possession of a physical territory by Jacob's growing number of descendants. The New Testament tells us about it and says that they, referring to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they confessed they were strangers and pilgrims. They seek a homeland, but now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly country. And therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. You see, Jacob belonged to the Lord. That's why he could say, I'm going to be gathered to my people, and I want to be buried in that land which prefigures, which speaks of, Heaven, the permanent home where I'm going, that better land. He was going home and his funeral was a statement of that. You're not burying me in Egypt. He belonged to the Lord and he belonged to the Lord not because of something that he had done, but because of God's grace to him in revealing himself to Jacob and Jacob coming to faith in him. The New Testament, part of the Bible, explains to us 
something of the message that's there in the Old Testament, but perhaps is not quite so clear. And in what we read in the Old Testament, it, so often it points us to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is spoken of in the New Testament as Christ, our hope. Listen to what Peter, by the Holy Spirit, writes to a group of Christians, people who had put their trust in Jesus, people who had been touched by death and had seen some of their own companions cruelly killed. And this is what he says. But, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who once had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Light had entered their darkened minds and they had seen at last that their only hope was Jesus Christ. Is that you and I this morning? And these people to whom Peter wrote tasted, received, embraced the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. God having meted out the just judgment upon our sin he had meted that out instead upon the Saviour for all those who will believe in him. Of course the Lord is remarkably gracious and he does bring comfort to those who sorrow of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. He will do that. But it's another thing altogether to be in that place where for you this whole issue of death and for me this whole issue of death is dealt with effectively, properly, fully. And that will only be the case when you and I, by faith, Share in Christ's victory on the cross at Calvary. The victory over death and sin and hell itself. And one day, one day, every believer in Jesus, their soul that is forever present with the Lord, will join a brand new body which by a miracle God creates for each one. And this is how the Bible puts it. So when this corruptible, this corruptible body, when this corruptible is put on incorruption, and this mortality is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Because from that point on for the believer, there will be no more death and decay. No more sorrow, just joy forevermore in the presence of Jesus, the Saviour. Dealing with death? May I put it to you as a question this morning? I trust that you have known God's comfort in those times of loss and sorrow in death. But have you dealt with death in, in this way in the Bible way and have seen that there is hope for you in Jesus Christ of everlasting life through him you see you, you and I can trust in the person of Jesus Christ we can embrace and receive and believe every single word that he spoke that has been recorded for us and he has not failed in what he came to do when he came to save sinners like you and I in his death on the cross. And neither will he fail now. And you and I then can be part of that 
great and wonderful resurrection to life in that great day when the truth of that statement, death is swallowed up in victory, shall be seen so clearly by everyone. Trust in Christ. Lay hold of that hope. And if you have, then let it be the most powerful motivator in your life to live for Jesus Christ who loved you and gave himself for you.